So. Uh, wow. Yeah. No, I, I hear you on the sour milk smell. I do that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've been, I try heat whenever I go in the kitchen for real. It's crazy. Well, it's like you get every so often you just got to throw a plinko down the drain or something like that. Maybe, maybe, maybe I should go get some kind of drink. I know the first time I moved into this house, like the first or second week, I was want, I was coming home from work and I was like, what in the world is that? And I have never smelled yeah. like dead mice before, but I am almost right. 100% sure it was a dead mouse somewhere in the walls. Uh, see, I've smelled that because we have cats. Yeah. Because all the time I'll be like, there's something dead in the living room. And for like a week, everyone's like, I don't smell anything. There's no animals in there. Right. I, I, I believe that. And, and it's always the same look. It's like I'm in a movie and I'm like <laughs> seeing the monster tearing apart the plane on the wing out the window in the oh, twilight yes. zone. Yes. Everyone's like, I believe that you smell something, <laughs> but it's, it, there's nothing. And it's always, I've never been wrong. There's always something dead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Is that something that happens though? That like the drain just starts producing sour milk smell? I think so. Because that would explain that would explain a lot. Yeah. Because like several times throughout my life, I've been like, there, there there's sour milk somewhere mm -hmm. in this room, and we never find right any source, but it just goes away. So yep. Well, I'm not. You need to. Yeah, I'm not. Get some drink. Right. I'm not one to really keep up on like, <coughs> taking the trash out, but. Mm -hmm. Unless it's like packed full and I'm like, okay, yeah, I can't cram another thing in this thing. But every so often I'll throw something out that just starts to go. And then I yeah, come home yeah, and I'm yeah. like, oh, yep, time to take it out, even if it's not full up. <laughs> yeah, I, I do the same. I really, I really shouldn't because of this very specific problem that I have. Right. But. Yeah, you're <clears throat> Uh, um, actually, you know what? I think if I'm not mistaken, Call of Cthulhu, unless you get like the, the main like books uh -huh. is free. And I don't think yes, Adventures in Middle Earth is. So that might actually be the deciding. Okay. Yeah, I know I looked it up on <coughs> drive through RPG and like mm -hmm. everything that was uh, everything COC related was like zero dollars. Buy it. <coughs> I'm like, really? Okay. Hey, right, so right. I yeah. Just grabbed everything. Yeah. I don't know where I put it, but <laughs> I have it all somewhere. Yeah. The uh, yeah, the adventure that I'm probably gonna run first. That that's for uh, cool. the uh, um, basic rules. Yeah. Hmm. Very good. Yeah, I, I that must be easier for like older, more established publishers like Chaosium to do. Right. Yeah. I guess they also they also don't really they don't really spend any money on presentation, which is not bad. Like I'm not you know uh, the Alien RPG that came out recently, mm -hmm. they sp obviously spent a lot of money. Uh, and like time and effort on the presentation because gotcha. it's beautiful. Every book is is gorgeous. Uh, there's so much art, uh, and I bet that's really nice uh, when you're playing in person and spent fifty dollars on yeah. one book. Oh, well, uh, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> D and D <coughs> player guide is just like, oh man, I could just look at the pictures here and be happy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same was with the Numenaria. <coughs> Although that, new, I think it's called Numenaria. Um, some sci-fi system. And Numen Numenera. Numenaria, I think it is. But Numenera, Numenaria. Uh, okay. Yeah, new, I'm, I'm looking at Numen Numenera, Numenera, something like that. That would that maybe. Sounds, <coughs> yeah, I might just be spelling yeah, it wrong. That's what that's what Google uh, Google corrected me. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've never seen this before, but it looks looks pretty. It is. It, I mean, I have not looked into the actual gameplay hardly at all, but yeah, uh, the the graphics on it were just like wow. And of course, Humble decided to 
release it for 25 bucks for the entire <laughs> 50 books or whatever, which I'm like, yeah, I can't fail with that. Let me, let me open up my cat. My, uh, <coughs> against the cult of the reptile god books. So you did you did you get around to playing the uh, the um, uh, the choose your own adventure? What's no, it called again? Not. Yeah, the out of the flame, I think it was, or out of the something. No, no, yeah, I never yeah, did yeah. get around to that. It was just <laughs> my... that's that's all right. that's all right. It's it's you know it, it, it's it's not essential, right? But it did save me time because I now have a blank character sheet in paper. <laughs> oh, right. So. Uh, <coughs> At some point, I might have to go just because I start. If I talk too much, I start. Ah, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Oh, I opened. That's one. I opened up against the call of the reptile guy. Just didn't stick. Call so I'm opening up the seventh edition quick start. Okay. Uh, um, if I could just find out where I kept all of the <laughs> documents. What do you know about the system already? Like, uh, do you have any background with it? Uh, very, very little. The the little I remember looking into it, it's more like um what's that star trek reference that they're always making picard loves his little detective mystery things, oh like 1920s detective stuff yeah yeah and yeah that's kind yeah. of the feeling i get from it i'm like hmm okay definitely like they, they call their the player characters investigators right uh. Yeah, I feel like the main the main thing that like is like the first <coughs> the biggest difference uh, structurally that I found from D and mean, I guess really the biggest differences are in tone and the way it plays every day, but like mechanically, I guess it's it's it's, it's um it's, instead of D twenty, it's percentile dice. Oh, I see like the core. That's so you got to roll under your stats I see. instead of over. Or you don't add any modifier. You roll the percentile die. And oh, try to roll so equal to or yeah. lower than your score. Got it. So like low lower rolls are better. <laughs> that said, I probably should get dice then. Oh yeah, me too. Let me hop up real quick and get those. I also have a rubber Rubik's Cube eraser.
see how much. <coughs> Starter set, 10 bucks. Oh, right, yeah, not the starter set. Seventh edition quick start guides. I just found it, you can find it just by like Googling the. Uh, yep. Yep. I just, although, I guess this is probably in the starter set. Yeah, I just. And uh, you know what else is in the starter set? The adventure that I want to run. Huh. But it's also free. The starter set is? They uh, not know. the starter set, but they, almost everything that's in the starter set. Oh, I see. Yeah, I'm going to have to do a quick search after this and <laughs> find all those files. Mm -hmm. I think they got caught in the laptop crash of 2021. Oh. <laughs> it's a shame. I, I, everyone's laptops are dropping like flies. My friend, his girlfriend, my laptop. Uh, another friend of mine just, like, just, just lost a lot. Wow. And not just, <laughs> not just me, but also my phone went, like, three days ago. The same oh, exact wow. problem as my laptop, power failure. Uh, and my mom's laptop oh. is starting to flake out as well. I'm just like, man. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I dropped mine one too many times. Yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm in that boat, too. <laughs> <coughs> So it looks like, oh, does it have a page fit? Yeah, that'll work. Go with what, uh, let me go through what I've learned okay. recently, because that, 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 that might help me to yeah. go over it. Um. Let me open up a character. Oh, I'll open up roll twenty. I know I made a cheat there. All right. Oh, and I have a paper. I have a paper sheet that I made for alone against. Ah. <coughs> what I don't understand quite is the the idea that. There are like three different versions of character sheets. Three versions of character sheets? Yeah. It was like 1920s standard, uh, oh. modern, pulp, down darker, reign of terror. Right. I think I do understand. I think I do kind of understand this. Maybe, maybe, maybe not, but um, it, it might be because I know that there's um, different. Uh, like the time, the time period is very important to okay. Paul Cthulhu, um, and by default, it's in the 1920s. But there may be a default sheet more flexible, and then maybe there's like one that actually has like 1920s technology and economics built into it. Mm -hmm. But like your credit rating is, you know, on your character sheet. So like capitalism and uh, oh. <coughs> stuff is like built into the mechanic. Game. I see. So if you're running a game in modern times, uh, you know the amount of money is different, that kind of thing. But also, more fundamentally, the like way characters think about concepts hmm. uh, it might be different. <laughs> like if you're running a medieval game, religion is such an entirely different thing, and the way in which people relate to the supernatural. And I think that that's a lot more mechanical. In uh, <coughs> in Call of Cthulhu, then it would be in, uh, because you have things like sanity rolls, right? Uh, a lot of like changes in a character in a character's like state of mind is a lot more mechanical than it would be in D and D. Kind of like Dungeon World, almost. Because okay. I know Dungeon World actually makes character growth mechanical in the way that like you change your bonds and, and things right <coughs> actually experience does 
and this isn't like exactly the same, but I think I don't know where I put my character, so I'll just make a note. Well, at the moment, I have the 1920s character sheet printed out. If that makes any difference okay. with you, what you were thinking. <coughs> uh, I can sure. print out a yeah, different one if you want me to. Well, can you send me? Can you send me like a picture of it or something? Uh, what's on it? <laughs> or just send me the sheet. Okay. <laughs> oh, right, because you're prone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you know where you got the sheet? I got it um, from the drive through RPG, but I think it is. Oh, right. Oh, it's like the, it's the 1920s. Yeah, it says here, 1920s era investigator. Although, gotcha. although the 1920s character sheet has a picture of some flapper girl on the upper left, whereas mine does not. So it actually okay. may just be the standard. I think it is the standard. Yeah. No, but but that's also that is nineteen twenties era. True. Is basically standard. Yeah. Doing thing. a quick visual, it looks <coughs> precisely identical to standard. So I can't remember if this book is free, but I you know, I have it. <laughs> um yeah. but uh um there's a book called uh, Cthulhu Through the Ages that, that gives you like basic rules for adapting Seventh edition Call of Cthulhu to any. Uh, I recognize you know, the name uh, of this book, several. which would indicate that yes, it is probably free. Okay. Um. Yeah, and it has some really interesting choices for like what they what they put in, like what they what they adapt for that book. And uh, okay. So it's by default it's nineteen twenties, but it's a, but. I feel like the base is pretty flexible. Like you can you can go into the the fifties, or you can go back to the to like you know slightly earlier. Um, <clears throat> but um, I guess it probably it probably adapts easier forwards. Than, but anyway, uh, no, that's probably not true though, because then you have to add stuff. But they've got <laughs> Cthulhu Invictus, which is you know, ancient Rome. Or Greece or something. Uh, Dark Ages, Mythic Iceland, where, where they have like magic and stuff. That sounds extremely um, cool. Yeah, uh, and then they do. Then they then they wrap that section up with swords and arrows, which is just collection of all those rules and like the stuff to adapt adapt it into a setting where you know a, a medieval or similar setting. Swords and sandals. Okay. Uh, uh, and then they've got Gaslight, be like Charles Dickens, I guess. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Which reminds me of the Doctor Who episode, <laughs> where they summon ghosts from the gaslights. Oh, right, right. I, I, I never, I was never able to get into Doctor Who. Yeah. It was just too, I mean, I lived in England for years, but just, there, there's something, there's something I can't connect to. It's just so fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just just the the um, the ways in which it is sincere and the ways in which yeah me it's, it's just sometimes sometimes that's hard to connect to like the level of sincerity of something can be a real sticking point for people. Gotcha. <laughs> I just don't know how to how to how to digest it. Yeah. Um. Seems cool. Uh, <laughs> let me see when Cthulhu Gaslight is actually going to be. But anyway, then there's Dreamlands, which is very specific to Lovecraft. I, I, I never read any Lovecraft, but as I understand it, Dreamlands is is uh, it's like the a concept world. in his books. Okay. Like to, just a place that people dream themselves to build things out of. Ah. Uh. So it's very, very fantastical, but also a bit niche, I would guess. That sounds it's... like a, oh my gosh, that sounds like a kind of a, a role-playing setting that I dealt with when I was doing the mud Achaia. 
or actually, I'm oh. st I still am. But I don't know what that is. it's a text game, uh, on the text game. Oh, oh, right, right, right. I think I have. Heard of it. I don't really know anything about it, but. Well, they were the biggest uh, for a long time, but I got involved with a divine order of uh, sleep and dreams, and they got into, like, really weird, deep um, world-building concepts inside the game, which was kind of out there. Uh, it's, that, sounds, that sounds really cool. Yeah, like world-building uh, inside of a world that's already built. <laughs> So. Oh, right, right, right. I'm going to be right back. Okay. So, I'm going to automatic zoom page width. That'll be better. All right, I'm back. All right. Yeah, that 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 does sound that does sound very. Um. Uh, and then there's Cthulhu Icarus, which is like just sci-fi. It's like, uh, you know, it, 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 it's pretty non-specific. Like it seems like they that one that one seems underdeveloped because yeah, because like if you wanted to do an alien thing, it it kind of works. And if you wanted to do a really bare bones like Star Trek type thing, you could. But you know, if you were going to do a campaign in either of those type settings, you would definitely build it out a lot. It nice. might work for a one shot. Yep. Uh, and then there's Cthulhu End Times, which uh, seems weirdly a little bit more heroic, just because thing things have to be so big, but it's. It's, uh, I guess, a post, uh, post any regular Call of Cthulhu campaign that doesn't go well. Interesting. That was one D&D &D setting I never really got to try, but kind of wanted to, was um, the, what was it called? The, the, the uh, Spelljammer. Oh, Spelljammer, yeah. Which was there. No, I've never, I'm not. I got kind of close with one one DM who was trying to not not quite convert his setting into her, shit her setting actually because she's uh, she's trans uh, now but back in the, back in the day mm -hmm. uh, but yeah yeah her uh, game uh, she was before <laughs> um, the uh, um, I'm learning. Uh, um yeah the setting was getting uh started like started uh escalating in that way I see. Um, and the plan was that it would sort of become more spell jammer which i was which i was excited for cool. um, but but we never actually got around to that yeah. oh. so this laptop does not have Adobe Acrobat Reader, believe it or not. Oh, yeah, I've run into that. <laughs> Gosh. So what is this? Well, my mom's also, like, oddly obsessed with factory resetting stuff. <laughs> hmm. Which is just a little bit weird. So when she's done with something, she factory resets it five times, just in case anybody Whoa. got a hold of it. I'm like, why? Whoa. But if anything goes bit, wrong, bit. her first line of attack is factory reset. I'm like, uh, oh, wow. <laughs> I guess everything's in the cloud. Or like, you know, no, that, nothing's that's, in that's the cloud. Extreme. She, uh, she, she, she doesn't. She travels light. <laughs> that and she has like fifteen years of backups that don't even mm -hmm. because she's also on a blackberry and 
will not move from BlackBerry to something that is actually <laughs> compatible with the rest of the world. Right. I can't get my backups. Well, I can't either because you are on a BlackBerry. <laughs> so, anyway. Oh, and at the end of uh, Cthulhu Through the Ages, they've got they got a different sheet for the you know for the setting. Okay. Uh, they look at you know uh, the Invictus one has has like columns up the sides. Right, right. There's tentacles wrapped around them, of course. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um. <coughs> so I picked out one of each of the dice that they're recommending, which... What's that? Is, it looks like... They're missing the twelve sided, but that's it. Yeah, I think I think they don't use a D twelve, like for the entire system. Like the 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 you're, you're looking at the um, uh, quick start rolls or the or the yeah the, um, page six of the quick start yeah right the um I think the starter kit came out and it didn't provide a D twelve and I was watching. I was watching this guy talking about the the uh, starter set because he Seth Skorakowski, who I'd never seen before, but I started watching him to learn um, to learn Call of Cthulhu, and he seems not, he seems he seems cool. I, I I don't really watch a lot of uh, tabletop YouTubers because they they usually annoy me. <laughs> Same um, here. What's his name though? Because I'm I, if he's impressive and actually it's a real dork ass you know like like the ponytail and all but he, he seems he seems earnest he seems um open-minded uh and it seems like one of my favorite one of my biggest hang-ups with with uh tabletop like rpg youtubers is i don't really and this this is this is a personal thing. This isn't like a, me saying that it's wrong to give advice, but I don't like giving advice. Like I, I, I people will ask me for advice for D and D and stuff like that, and I've always been uncomfortable with that. Right. Um, like I, I like sharing. What I always answer is like I, I really can't give advice. I don't like doing it, but I, you know, I'll share experiences, and and I always try to preface things with that. And I feel like not that. Skorkowski doesn't give advice, but it, it feels like a similar, it feels like we're kind of on, on the same wing, wavelength there. When he does give advice, it always feels based in personal experience. Um, <coughs> um, and when he does like speculate and talk about things that he thinks about uh, Call of Cthulhu or whatever, it's always very clear that it's more, it's less advice, it's less prescriptive, and more um, observational. Okay. Seth Skorkowski? Seth Skork. Uh, the, uh, I guess really the only other, like, person I watch that is, like, remotely educational uh, in in the world of tabletop games is uh, Matthew Colville. Hmm. Uh, and he's just, just sort of a similar, sort of a similar uh, yeah. vibe. A bit more, a bit more presentary. Like he's got a bit more um, flair to him yeah. in the way that he presents us. Uh, Skorakowski is very dry. Okay. <laughs> oh, Matthew Colville. I recognize this guy, <laughs> and I cannot stand him. <laughs> totally understand it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I've, I've seen a couple of his things, and I'm like, no, no, stop it. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, he's, he's very much got a specific presenting, like, style. It's not as, it's not as, yeah. I, know. I don't know, you might, you might be okay with Skorakowski, but if you do find him annoying, I, I totally, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think Skorakowski is not, he doesn't really. <laughs> I, I get the feeling that like 
he doesn't talk like this in person, mm -hmm. but he's not really doing a bit either. Like he's just a real, uh, yeah. It feels it feels earnest, and it feels it feels right. Yeah, <laughs> I gotcha. Because I know there was the guy that I shared a couple times in the Discord chat. I don't remember what his name is, but um, he does those animated ones where he basically oh like, um animates him his voice over top of his weird wizard character and yeah, I, I think I know what you're talking about. I don't remember his name, but yeah, I do. I do watch that again. <laughs> Z Bradshaw. That sounds right, yeah. <laughs> Never mind. I just found, I'm looking through my subscriptions on this thing, and I'm like, there's the Pro ZD kid, <laughs> which he did a more, I, I found him when I was looking at Magic the Gathering stuff, mm -hmm. and he was, he had this uh what was it it was some some sort of parody deck that he had made himself and it was like um farm animals are your monsters mm. <laughs> and your creatures mm. like just life on the farm That's and it was stupid and just yeah <laughs> okay. no the one guy it I is really... it is funny that like in the monster man can find just cow. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, the one, the one guy I really latched onto for a while is the DM's craft, which um, D DM's craft. You yeah, said? yeah. Which never, never. Yeah, he's this. Which guy, the you know, <laughs> he's this older, maybe that's good, middle-aged guy yeah. from Ohio, but he basically likes making his um his physical cardboard sets. Oh, I have seen, I have actually seen uh, a video because it was, it was for that. It was because there was some crazy uh, um, practical, like uh, paper mache set or something. That, yeah. That yeah. I wanted to see. That's cool. Yeah. The stuff, you know, actually, I actually, I cool. I guess I do. I guess I do watch kind of a lot of, <laughs> of uh, tabletop RPG stuff. Just not a lot of like, how to DM or whatever. Right, right. Geek and Sundry. I don't really watch much of them. I, 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 I mean, not since Critical Role moved to their own thing, but right. even you know, I, 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 I did watch a bit of Matt Mercer doing like DM tip stuff, but that, but that was like. When I when I saw that and I found it extremely unhelpful, I think that's when I was like, you know, maybe I just don't like people giving advice on this because yeah. it felt it felt nice, it felt really well intentioned. It didn't feel uh, cr like you know, you know bad in any way. Like they weren't doing anything wrong, but it just wasn't helpful, right. you know, through no fault of their own, uh, you know. And so that that's what made me because because before then I had watched unhelpful. Things like that, but because I didn't know anything about the person doing it, I could always write off. Well, this person's not helpful, but right, right. Uh, then you know Matt Mercer or, or someone similar doing a really <laughs> obviously genuinely trying to to be helpful and share their own experiences. It just didn't mm -hmm. it just didn't help me at all. Sure. Uh, and that uh, that said, he is extremely good at presentation. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm like, dang, I'll just listen to him. Read me audiobooks from now on. <laughs> but. Um, okay. Yeah. Right. I still don't 100% understand how the skills work with the. Um... I guess it is. Okay, so. Under investigator skills, like you, you get a certain number of skills that you get to pick. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on your profession, it might prescribe you some skills. Okay. Um, 
that uh, you know like in, when you make a character in fifth edition it'll say like pick two from this list yeah uh, i don't know if it's quite as strict or maybe it's stricter i don't remember but it'll give you some and then others are just free for you to choose um and it'll it'll say like you have like four 45s you have two 25s you have like one 80 and and then you put like the 80 in navigate if you used to be a sailor or something Mm -hmm. and under navigate it already says 10 percent. so i think anyone has a 10 in navigate but if you put your 80 there it becomes nine i think that's how it works all right i'm not i'm not sure though (coughs) and i guess that just means that navigation is a common skill or maybe it has a a lower skill floor or ceiling or something i don't know but it, right it seems like genuine generally the more the rarer or more difficult skills have a lower starting percentage mm-hmm. um but then but then like handguns are easier than fast talking so i don't know uh, maybe that makes. Sense. I guess in the 1920s there were. Were there more guns in the 1920s? I don't know. Well, everybody goes on about the whole machine gun mob. Oh, Derek, that's right. There were fucking machine guns everywhere. Okay. I forgot about that. I I, I forget sometimes that that like oh yeah yeah it's all the <laughs> Chicago mob and stuff like that so. Do they have automatic weapons on this? Just. <laughs> <coughs> it might be just one you have to write in your own. Maybe the maybe this is the 1920s sheet. So the pilot right. starts with a one percent. Hmm. Okay. So there. So as far as characteristics go they're locking me into this 40 50 50 50 60 60 70 80 thing oh you're yeah yeah i'm just which page are you on uh page six still yeah that was just i was just will spirit mental stability wow so there's like a, a starting oh, okay allocate the following values where you like among your characteristics mm-hmm. oh right so this is like your this is the skills this is your yeah so the characteristics are strength constitution power dexterity appearance size intelligence education <laughs> that is a learning curve because because i i'm so ingrained in my mind yeah. is the uh D and D array, which mm-hmm. is not perfect. I've right. always had complaints about those stats, but it's gonna be hard to shake it. Yep. I was really surprised when I found that this system does the same weird thing that D and D does, which is that dexterity is both like aim and fine motor skills and agility and reflexes Mm. and reaction times like it's all those very different mostly unrelated things combined into one stat that always seemed like a very D &D thing like it's it's just a legolas stat gotcha but the fact that this system does it too actually really surprised me because this is an old system it's like it's not that much younger almost exactly the same for the entire time it's changed so much less than D has right so the fact that it does that surprise me. right right uh so that's 25 and then they're doing this fifth and half thing and i'm like oh boy i need to get a count oh right because i don't know how to divide yeah, by so, five <laughs> yeah i think you don't have to do that when you first make a character it's just to make it easier later on right but yeah i think because like 
a regular check, you just have to roll under your stat. A hard check, uh, you have to roll half your stat or lower, which seems really hard. Like the the DCs in this game are brutal. Wow. Like the 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 uh, the um, I mean, I knew I knew going in that this that this is you know uh, how much higher fatality much uh like failure is easier and the consequences are higher um but but holy shit like <laughs> a regular check in a skill that you're relatively proficient in right could still have a 50 percent chance of failure yeah And then that failure could le- could be like two two checks away from instant death. Sure. Luck is three d six plus five, or time is five. That's weird. So one. What's that? Five. All right. Six times five is 30. My luck is 30 according to this. Mm. There's an alternate rule that I learned about before I basically, before I learned anything about the system and I do really like it. Mm. It's like one of my favorite mechanics that I've learned from this game, but it's not even in the base rules. Um, I think normally luck is just like a static thing that you re-roll against like any other stat. I don't know that for sure, but there's a rule that <coughs> that you can uh, uh, if you fail a roll, but it's close, and it's a really important roll. Yeah, like you might die if you fail it, and you failed it by a little. You can push your luck, Ooh. and that just means you, on a one-to-one basis, subtract your luck score and add that to the roll. So you can make it succeed, but you are permanently expending this extremely valuable resource oh, of luck. Dang, dang, that is so interesting. But but it can save your life. Yeah. So it's in this game, you know, that it can happen. Uh, and so that just seems like a really cool mechanic of like actually pushing your luck, like making that expression into a mechanical, a very fun mechanical uh, uh, interaction. That looks extremely neat. So, I 100% plan on using that alternate role. That's cool. <coughs> well, that said, I have very low luck. <laughs> I just rolled a 30. <laughs> right. Total. Right. <laughs> Out of 100. Mm-hmm. Uh, so magic points are one-fifth power. Well, I chose power as my low <laughs> my low stat. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, I completely understand power. What that what that represents? I was game. thinking it was like standard, like strength or something, but strength is its own thing. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's more like like willpower. That makes sense to me. Willpower, but it, it is it's used for magic. Okay. Uh, it, it relate it relate, but magic is its own thing, right? Because you have magic points. <laughs> but I think the magic points are based on power, so I don't know. Strength and then how does size. you roll against your sanity, not against your power? I don't when you roll sanity, but it is mental stability, so maybe it relates to sanity in some way. Hmm. <coughs> so I get the feeling that um, no, no. I was gonna say something about charisma, but not. Really. It's kind of close, I would imagine. Appearance is a weird one because it's they changed his name to appearance, and I was like, "Oh, that's interesting that they're separating charisma and appearance." But they're not. It's it's just charisma from D and D. It's the same stat. It's not just appearance. It's it's uh, it's charisma. It's it's uh, a mix of uh, all those things. Build is zero. <coughs> Damage bonus is none. I do like that strength and size are are different. Right. 
that seems that seems like a modern RPG type of thing. What is weird to me is how they say you can have a damage bonus of negative two and a build of negative two if you have a strength plus size of two to sixty four. I'm like well with the values you're they had me put in as my base stats, that's gonna be impossible mm. to ever hit two. 80 plus 70 is 150. <coughs> yeah. Well, and then you, your stats can also go down. Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. Oh. So size plus constitution. Because I do get the impression that the way, like, characters in D&D &D obviously grow up. Like, they get, they get exponentially stronger. Right. As you level up in Dungeon World, they sort of grew. They did also get stronger, but they there was a a much um, sharper cap on their growth, mm -hmm. and they uh, they uh, mostly sort of grew out and grew. Uh, you know, you you gain options rather than power. Uh, yeah. This game very much the characters like. You don't really get any more health when you level up. You kind of just get more options and right. more specialized. Uh, but you also, there's stuff that goes down over time that, like, you, you definitely, there's a level of en entropy to your character that, like, the more you level up, the more like, you're going to lose sanity. Mm -hmm. And eventually it's going to run out. So... Like, I think retiring a character is much more common in this game. Like, quitting while you're ahead. Right. Because I know you're one that really likes to, I mean, on the DM side, take the mobs and remove them from battle. Before they oh, die. you cut out. Oh, sorry. I you, was just saying. That's okay. You're, you're one DM that really likes to take the monster and remove it from battle before you it gets killed. Like, right yeah yeah i do i do generally <laughs> i guess i do do that a lot uh i i started i don't know when i started doing that but yeah i've been really trying lately to consider you know i've been i've been enjoying whether i'm doing it you know thinking about the way that uh, uh, an npc you know what an NPC's actual goal in the situation is, mm -hmm. um, and where like you know if it's if it's someone smart, usually they have a plan that doesn't involve killing you. That is more important than killing you, so they'll they'll leave so they can finish that. Sometimes that is undramatic though, so it's this, it's a weird it's a weird. Um, I have contradicting goals where I want you guys to keep your momentum and continue like you know killing the bad guy to, to go fight the bigger bad guy mm -hmm. and uh never let the enemy you know build up too much resistance against you because that that won't be fun but then also you know I, I it's important that they feel like they want to win and you know it doesn't feel like i'm creating that kind of artificial momentum for you you know i am I don't, know, I don't really have. I've never really found a solution to that. It's uh, something that I've, I guess, gotten better, um, but still not perfect. So, occupations and skills. Oh boy. Choose an. Oh yeah. So other uh, yeah. So it's not. That's another thing that's really different. It's not a class based system there's no classes um in the in the same way that, i mean you could say that the occupations are classes in a way like they are pretty built sort of but they're a much smaller part of the character right um yeah it is more it's, it is so it's, it's a they say it's a skill-based game not a uh, not a class-based game <coughs> the skills that you have sort of take the place of class but it's a lot more granular 
the characters built in little parts instead of in right. umbrellas. Just need to see how that was. So, <coughs> but yeah. Yeah, and I like that idea quite a bit. Yeah. It's just something different. Definitely. Uh, I, I thought I always thought fourth edition seemed interesting in that way because you would pick a class, but then the class itself was built out of these little choices um, of which powers you used. Oh, Dungeon World was the same. Every time you leveled up, you'd get a new move. Yeah. Yes, you would. Language other own language. <laughs> Dungeon World was almost almost skill based that way, not quite, hmm. but it still did cling to the to the still did have very much a class, very much a class structure. I guess cause yeah, yeah. Literally, like the mechanics, a lot of the mechanics were like oh, one of my favorite things about Dungeon World was the class damage. Like, we different weapons didn't do different damage. Your class did damage, right? Which uh, that always, whenever I would introduce the game to someone, they would people didn't like that. I, I don't know. I liked it a lot when I first saw it, but it, I think I think it struck people immediately as very limiting, mm -hmm. and it definitely is um, because it means that if you're a wizard, you're never going to be good, no matter what you do at using a, a weapon. But I mean, uh, you know, the, the game's following a tone. Uh, following a genre sure. in that way. An example of people always I've heard people use for like the lethality of this game, both as an example of like why it's maybe not as lethal as people have told you, or as an example of how yeah it's like really really lethal. I didn't meet myself. Um, <coughs> is it like a, a, a handgun deals a D10 damage? It's entirely possible that you may have like 12 health mm -hmm. and be an experience, like be, be a high level character. I don't know if there are levels, but right, right. You know, be an experienced character. Uh, <coughs> And have twelve health. The enemy might have a thing like a, they might be a veteran and have experience with a handgun that gives them an extra D four damage. Mm -hmm. So they could take a handgun shot at you, roll a ten, get roll a two on their on their damage, and kill you. Right. Yeah. But then I, I do think from that point, like once you drop to zero hit points, I think there still is a chance of recovery. It's not as easy as as D and D with the death saves, but um, and it does mean that you're going to be even if you make a full recovery and if like everyone's on top of it instantly and keeps you from dying, you're still definitely going to be in the hospital for like a month. Yeah, that's another thing. The pacing of this game is so different. Really? Because he, healing takes weeks. Oh, oh. That's kind of like the uh, Dungeon World Debilities, then. It's like the Dungeon World what? Debilities. Yeah, yeah. Where? But like way, way heavier because you, you just have to skip that time because gotcha. you're bedridden. <laughs> Okay, now what am I looking at as far as this weird uh, percentage on in, on skills and credit rating? They say, uh, what do you the, mean? Al allocate the following values to occupational skills and the credit rating oh. skill. 70, 70, <laughs> right, and, and so like you're talking about on the skills, 
it'll say like mech repair 10 parentheses 10 percent yeah and they say replace that with 70 percent 60 percent 50 percent oh 40 percent i th- i thought that the that the percentage there added to whatever value you put there uh, they're, i guess not you're saying replace okay they're saying allocate set the skills directly to these values and ignore the skill base values written next to each okay. skill okay so i think that the, the 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 those are skills that like even if you didn't pick them as a skill you still have some like if you don't pick natural world as one of your skills and you have to make a natural world role, you still have a 10% chance of succeeding, even if you're not experienced. I see. I'm just wondering what in the world to, what the because, uh, because what otherwise is actually mean. Like, so that means if you had, if you rolled a, a, net, a natural world skill, you would have to roll 10 or lower on the percentile die. So interesting. If your skill is twenty five, that that literally means you have a twenty five percent chance of success. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think. Um, and like, if you pick fifty for your strength, that means you have a fifty percent chance of success on a roll. Um, and if you had to make a hard roll, then that would be half to twenty five, and you'd have a twenty five percent chance of success. Because um, I think the, the I think the reason for the base, the like starting values that are beside a skill, even if you don't have proficiency, is because even if it, very few of these skills have a zero percent chance of success for someone who didn't ch- choose them as one of their skills, mm-hmm. if a complete uh, uh, medicine neophyte like they still have actually looking at it, it's one percent chance so i guess medicine is a really that one has a, a learning curve but there's still a one percent chance that someone who didn't take medicine as a skill might succeed which is a lot harder than D where the base dc for everything is 10. Yeah, right so you still have like a 50 percent chance of success if you uh don't know if you know if you don't have that skill. Archaeology starts at all is or anthropology, archaeology, those those skills seem to start at one percent because they require a lot of upfront knowledge. Mm-hmm. I imagine in you know in a modern setting, anthropology anthropology and archaeology would have a higher base just because the like that you know an average person is a lot more knowledgeable these days about uh, sciences like that sure sure so i guess in that way that's that's another reason different settings have their own sheets yep makes sense all the physical like for medieval settings and stuff probably some of the physical stats might some of the like simple physical stats that don't require experience might be a little bit higher on average, but mostly the educational skills are all going to be lower. <coughs> so, so that's what 40, 40, 40, 60, 60, 50, and I'll put 50 in credit rating, whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think at least for um, one shots and stuff, they don't have you spend money when you go shopping. But there's like, if you're if you're getting something expensive enough, or if you're buying things too often, the DM can lower your credit rating or something. Right. But like, as long as you're shopping within your means. You don't, I think, I think your credit rating is just like where the warning, where the warning uh, alarm like goes off. You know, if, if, uh, if you have a low credit rating, then you might start losing credit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
when you buy a gun, but uh, okay. if you have a higher credit credit rating, it's not gonna. You know, you could get mugged. In your credit rating is. I don't know for I don't know if that's how it works. That's a guess. Okay. Yeah. And then of course divide by two, divide by five. Oh golly. Ten. <laughs> I don't think I don't think we got to worry about that right now because that's just right. that's just like in preparation of you know when you actually run a game. Sure. At some point you're gonna have to make a hard check, but like you know you could also just do it then. Like it's easy if you have a fifty skill then like you can kind of go forever without writing down those skills because you just you can I, I mean at least i'm terrible at math but i feel like i could remember if i have a 50 no you know i probably forget sometimes but if i had a 50 in brawl right. uh whenever i brawled and it was hard i, I would probably be able to remember okay. to roll 25 or lower Maybe not. But then, you know, to save me from doing that math, I could help just write 25. But then, but then it would be necessary to write down, you know, if I had a 74 in one of my skills, I really want to write down whatever half of that is and whatever a quarter of that is so I don't have to do that math every time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we don't think that over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh backstory oh golly <laughs> oh yeah that's an intent because i don't do backstory usually at least i don't write backstory for my characters i uh i make choices for the backstory right uh but i usually just write a couple details in list form sure. and if there's something important to the dm then i'll go into detail but i, I don't really write i guess i don't write a lot maybe i should write more yeah it's uh, sometimes fun but, but... I don't know. It's, but I definitely don't write things for my for my characters. Yeah. <clears throat> we have, weirdly, I, I often do a, a, a brief family tree, which is totally unnecessary, but it, it does help me think about the character a bit. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is just because I I, I, you know, I I like the Tolkien stuff. That was that was. Uh, I've read The Silmarillion, which was, you know, it's, it's not a good book, but I really liked it. Is it not? Cause I, I don't think, we, I do really like it, but I, I would never recommend it to someone. I mean, it's, it's so boring. I see. Again, I really liked it. I really enjoyed it, but I don't know. I, I guess it depends on what you mean. Is it a good book? Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's, I, yeah. I mean, did you, you, you liked it, I'm I, guessing? I have never read it, but I've always wanted okay. to just because. I mean, it, you know, I, I'm not going to dissuade you from reading it. Like, I had a really great time reading it. I, yeah. Oh, you know what? I actually didn't. I got really bored and I moved to the audiobook and then I had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> but that's also, I don't, I don't do a lot of reading. I don't do enough reading. Yeah, yeah. Um, same here. Um, but no, I mean, it's, I don't think it's particularly well written. I mean, it's very archaically written. Like it's written, like Tolkien already kind of writes, um, like he's doing history, not writing a novel. Right. Um, that's, that's sort of a joke you can make about the Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's at least like engaging when he does. It's funny when he does that, and especially in The Hobbit, the like when he does that, it's it's funny. It's 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 whimsical. Like he'll write about the history of the Hobbits, and it's very charming. Sure. But the Silmarillion, I mean, it wasn't even written by you know. It was collected. It was it was sort of uh, amassed into a book by his one of the, one of his sons. I can't remember which. But like. There's a whole goddamn chapter of that book that is literally just describing the landscape of Beleriand uh, to the to the extent that like <clears throat> he will describe the, a river from the mountain that it 
that it, you know, the, the talking about which mountains it comes out of and like, you know, what settlements live on, you know, it curves this way. And then suddenly it descends into the valley of, like he'll use exciting language to describe this, to the, the, the movements of this river and it dulls your brain <laughs> into thinking like, oh, what's going to happen? Oh, it, it, it suddenly, what happens? It, it turns, the river turns. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do remember getting to that chapter, and, and it blew my mind how boring it was. Wow. But I had a really, great, I had a really great time reading. It, so you might, you might too, if you're into that. Mm -hmm. I'm usually not into, like, into lore. I get, I get real. My eyes glaze over when, when the game or something tries to give me lore without earning it. But uh, uh -huh. this, I don't know. I don't know. Tolkien's got me. Uh, looking over the second page of this, I'm thinking that's probably a bit superfluous. Uh, of the Silmarillion or of, 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 the, of the character sheet for Call of Cthulhu? Oh, the character sheet? Yeah. Oh, I don't even know what's on the second page. Personal description, ideologies, significant people. Oh, uh, gotcha. I think that stuff is important for Call of Cthulhu, but it's not really something you can, like, you know that, that you've got to do that when you actually make a character you know right it's kind of a it might be kind of a waste of time to do it mm -hmm. here i mean i guess it would be useful to like to know i don't know it probably tells you like what kind of stuff you might want to put there because uh, i know important you're supposed to have you're supposed to write like important people uh important institutions for your character so like the british museum might be a really important part of a character because they worked there and their their father worked there and their father's father worked there I you know see. and that could really inform the character's philosophy in the 1920s when it might not be a popular belief that like the british museum is full of stolen artifacts mm -hmm. but that's true and, and people back then thought that uh, it, even though it wasn't as mainstream of a thing to say. So right. that could really, that could be a really important part of character. Interesting. Uh, when they go insane, they might go on some, uh, you know, racist uh, uh, spree that like w wouldn't be that uh, socially unacceptable at the time. So like, you know, it's not that that would necessarily make them, you know, you could make a character that's perfectly decent uh for call of cthulhu but like you know when they lose their sanity that <laughs> that might be a problem that they you know gotcha. british museum is an important part of their character so so you know that, that's why i think backstory is more important mechanically in this game okay <clears throat> it's not just when you start losing sanity but I just it's think like, that that's when it's like the prime example of when stuff might mm -hmm. out. <laughs> right. When you want to flip over to that second, start hearing the voice of your grandfather or something. Yeah, I mean, personal personal description uh, obviously might be important. I I, I do you know um, Skorakowski had a really nice video talking about Call of Cthulhu's relationship to history hmm. um, and how like <clears throat> I mentioned he seems open minded and a lot of the ways that he talks about. Um, the politics of uh, the, the, this 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 game and, and and that sort of thing, I think are really enlightening and really like I don't know. He, he seems to understand in a way that's that's nice. But um, he'll talk about how like racism is a very important part of America. It's a very important part of uh, you know our, our lives and. But it's not fun, right? And so there's there's a there's a balance of, um, you know, 
it's both, you know, you don't want to completely skirt by it, but you don't want to be disrespectful in ignoring it. And, and, you know, just talking about how that's obviously very dependent on the group uh, and the DM or GM keeper, I guess. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, He would talk about, like, he did give examples of how he runs things and uh, I think this is one of the, this is, this is a part, this is something that I, I, I guess kind of made me like him more. Um, he said, and at first I didn't like this. He said one rule he has about um, prejudice in his games is that he uh, generally doesn't have institutional pre- prejudice and he lays it on individuals which I generally think is a problem when media does that. Like that's, that's a very Disney thing to do to just pretend that like, Oh, you know, there's not really racist institutions. It's just this guy is racist. Right. But the way that he explained that made me kind of respect him doing that for his game. Uh, Cause it, it totally made sense. It didn't, it didn't seem disrespectful in that context. Uh, it seemed like it could, I think an example he gave was that, I can't remember what the law is, but like whatever, whatever the 1920s law that like uh, you could arrest a woman for crossing state lines without being accompanied by a man. Mm-hmm. Um, he generally, you know, won't enforce that law against any uh, female like player character. But if they fail a role to sneak by um, state lines and they're like they're doing it for a totally different reason because they're smuggling an artifact or something and they get caught again no not because of this law but the if they fail their roles and everything the cop might use that law as an excuse to waylay them gotcha um and so he'll bring he'll bring uh (coughs) institutional prejudices into the game in that way um uh, and that, that that wasn't prescriptive. Like he wasn't saying that that's how you should do it. I don't think that's how I would do it. But uh, I don't know. I, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, that totally <laughs> just sparked my imagination. As for all these backstory items, yeah. I'm like, dang. Okay, so significant yeah. people. Barbara, the head librarian at the university. Uh, probably Felipe is not a great Indian name, but I'm thinking some Indian <coughs> non-baker. <laughs> yeah, that he walks past every day, stops in for <coughs> if it's early enough, and then Mr. Mrs. Jalovsky, his landlady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a totally different creative process making a character for this game. It seems like from like D and D. Ah, University of Chicago. Yeah, I I, um, I I made him some sort of professor. Cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I guess the only there is there is one video I I might recommend of Skorkowski's, except that I don't know which one it is. Um, but maybe I'll try to find it where he talks about um, like he basically he talks about triggers warnings. Uh, he doesn't use that word, but he talks about there's an there's an old RPG expression um, for mostly I think it mostly came out of like this game or, or games like it like horror games. Uh, um, I can't remember what it's called. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, but it's some some framework by which. Uh, a character can give a DM like things that they don't really want to be in the game or mm-hmm. <clears throat> there were like two levels. There were, I wish I could remember the term, but one of them was like, you can, you can engage with this thing, but I don't really want to dwell on it. So if you can fade the black or something or, or just uh, mention in passing or just, just don't get too much into the weeds with, for me, one of them would be torture, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm okay if it's there, but, like, 
let's not get into it. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and then there's, there's like, uh, hard lines, uh, where like, you know, <laughs> I guess if it related to personal trauma or something. Sure. makes sense to me. But that's, yeah. But, but, uh, you know, Skorakowski talked about how like some people think that you should, you should, uh, I think he said that people ask him, should I use my friend's phobias in a game? to make it more scary because it's a horror game. Mm -hmm. And he did a long ramble about how I don't really agree with the, the way that the question is phrased. I don't remember what he said about that, but in, at the end he was like, if I have to engage with the question uh, the way that it's worded, no, you shouldn't. Um, and he basically talked about how like, even though Call of Cthulhu generally like the adventures that are written engage with real world anxieties there's a there's just a big difference between um things that someone can enjoy being afraid of and things that uh would be distracting like like using a real world something that's too real i guess it's kind of like suspension of disbelief or like right you don't want to waste uh, your time putting your player back together when you did something. Yeah. Like right. That right. Push the player yeah. off the edge. Yeah. yeah. Like it, things that are actually, cause, cause you do want to do things that are actually scary, but mm -hmm. there is a difference cause certain things, I guess, I guess it's only this, this is, sounds a little bit cold, but like, it's just not immersive. Right. <laughs> if, if there's like, it, like, you want things to be scary in a way that keeps someone engaged with the game. Mm -hmm. um, but sure. using someone's actual like negative experiences can take them out of the game and in a way make them less scared. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Interesting. Huh. Uh, shoot. It is interesting to hear an old hear like an old nerd talk about that stuff because I don't I don't usually think of I don't usually think of old guys with ponytails talking about right yeah uh, being woke like that no I say this I do have unfortunately I do have a ponytail at the moment um, so then I, I, I have a tendency not to cut my hair ever. right um, been sick and in quarantine on and off that's just your excuse. You know it looks cool. I shouldn't. I shouldn't throw uh, stones. Living in a glass house. <laughs> uh, I'll get a little bit detailed with this. Why not? What was that? Oh, I'm just jotting down. <laughs> More backstory stuff. <laughs> yeah. His father's Rolex is treasured possessions. His father's Rolex, the heirloom viola, fifth generation. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're getting into it. I'm like, okay, let's just Did you go with the period. I'm um, yeah, treasured. Did you Google period like watches? No, I'm just okay. <laughs> I probably ought to, because I don't know if Rolex was around in the 20s. <coughs> right. Uh, yes, 1920 to 29 manufactured Rolexes on eBay. They do look pretty interesting. Not terribly spectacular, except for the pocket ones. Yeah. The, the politics of Lovecraft are also an interesting because I, I am really into uh, I don't know if I'm really into I, I am into cosmic horror mm -hmm. and I enjoy the like um, you know the, the dwarves of Moria dug too deep and, and found something they shouldn't have like, right. I find that idea very compelling. Oh yeah. 
even though I don't really agree with sort of the, the, the philosophy that it comes out of, of like, we shouldn't know too much. We shouldn't play God. We shouldn't, you know, eventually knowledge and progression is going to destroy us. Like that sort of philosophy is something I've never really felt and I've never really agreed with. But I do find it really compelling. <laughs> so I don't know. <clears throat> Traits. Oh, good grief. I don't know. <laughs> Having glasses, is that an injury and scar or a trait? <laughs> <laughs> To you. Oh, I know something that I wanted that I don't understand too. Mm -hmm. The sanity, like the sanity um, roles, like what comes out of you know a failed sanity role. I know some of the things, some of the ways that it works. Sure. <laughs> oh, don't scroll too far because. The adventure I want to run is actually in this book. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I glanced, <coughs> but I didn't read anything, so I think we're good. Yeah, the, the Corbett, Corbett, Corbett House. Hmm. I don't know what it's called. Oh, a house? Oh, that's actually perfect. <laughs> Treasured possessions. is One of them is a photo of his great aunt, whose mansion he visited annually as a boy. Ah, so. it's the haunting scenario. That's what it is on page 18. So pay, page 18 to, let me see, just figure out what's off limits. Uh, page, page 18 to 31. Page 32 looks like it's, nope, 32 is still page 18, maybe to the end. Okay. I'm still scrolling. Yeah, page th uh, page uh, whatever page I said mm -hmm. uh, to the very end of the book. Uh, page thirty nine is just character sheet. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> what I is, yeah, eighteen is where you just. Chases seem like a really cool mechanic. They're, they're very weird. At first, I didn't like it, but it seems seems cool how it works. Uh, obviously, chases are pretty important in a game where you're heavily encouraged to run away. Right. often forced to run away because of your skills. Oh, golly. Of course, I write all my own phobias and manias in the phobias and manias section. <laughs> right. Oh, man. Hit points, wounds, and healing. I, I just skipped ahead on my order. <laughs> the two points hit points cannot fall below zero so you do not recognize negative value when a character's hit points reach zero he or she falls unconscious uh, and in some situations may die when a character takes damage uh, of greater than or equal to half of their full hit points in a single blow they have received a major wound. All right, I remember this. So on the sheet, I think there's a wound. <coughs> Some kind of wound. Yeah, there's a major wound box. I think I um, saw that. Maybe. Uh, let me, oh, yeah. yeah they, re they receive a major wound. They must make a con roll. 
or fall unconscious. Okay. So even if you don't fall to zero hit points, if you take half of your hit points in one hit, which is entirely possible, uh, then you still may fall unconscious. <clears throat> if a character with a major wound falls to zero hit points, they are close to death and dying. Uh, they must make a successful con roll at the end of each following round. Uh, and every round... Oh, at the end of... Yeah, the, at the end of the following round and every round thereafter, or die. So they will... They just will die if they reach zero hit points um, and have a con... or have a, a major wound. Uh, because there's nothing that stops those rolls unless someone uses first aid. I see. Yeah. <clears throat> and oh my god. Characters with a major wound heal one hit point per day. Uh, and they make a healing roll at the end of each week. You 1d3 hit points or 2d3 for an extreme success. I don't remember what an extreme success is. Scroll up and try to find. 100%. Oh, if you roll a 100, that's an extreme success? I have no idea. I just, that was just a Okay. Guess. <laughs> that might, I mean, that might, knowing this game and how unlikely it is to succeed. <laughs> Uh, that might, that might be it. But that would be a 1%. That would be literally 1 in 100. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, a regular task requires you to roll uh, equal to or less than your skill value or regular success. <coughs> Difficult task requires a roll. Oh! I see. So I think a hard success... If you if you have to make a regular check, just, just roll, you know, make a healing roll, and it's like, you know, roll below your con or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you roll... Let's say your con is 50, just to make the math easy. If you have to roll below, if you roll 50 or below, and you roll 25 or you roll 24, I think that's a hard success. You rolled below half of your skill. If you roll <coughs> a 10, that would be an extreme success because you rolled below a quarter of your skill. I think that's an extreme success. Now, if you had to make a hard check, I don't think you can have an extreme success. All right. Because, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but I think yeah. I remember this, that if you have to make a hard or extreme difficult check, that excludes you from reaching higher levels of success. You, you know. All right. All right. <coughs> But if you make a, if you excel at a regular role, there might be, you know, more benefits to an extreme success. I'm not actually seeing an example of what <coughs> Oh boy. What are these neighbors doing? Oh, brother. 
Huh? Oh, my neighbors are being weird as always. <laughs> Chasing a guy across the cul-de-sac with a pool cue. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> that is that is. And these are like teenage girls. I'm like, what? <laughs> All seems to be in good fun, but I'm like, yeah. yeah. These are the neighbors that just bug me anyway. <laughs> right. Oh, and then there's also yeah. there's also like penalty die and bonus die. I, I specifically remember watching one of those videos and hearing about, like, a lot of people are confused about uh, different difficulty levels and uh, extra die. Like, which, which one should you use? And I don't remember uh, the result of that. But, uh, yeah, I am confused now, currently. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll go back and watch that. But... Uh, in addition to, you know, raising or lowering the difficulty by halving or quartering the uh, difficulty, you can give someone an extra die mm -hmm. that makes their roll easier or harder. Uh, I don't know how that works because it's a because it's a percentile die. You're already using two die, so I don't know which which die the new one replaces. Let me read this. <clears throat> Bonus and penalty die. Sometimes the prevailing conditions for the investigators, the environment, and or time available to them can hinder or benefit a skill or characteristic role. Under certain conditions, the keeper may grant a bonus die or a penalty die to the role. One bonus die and one penalty die can cancel each other out. <clears throat> um, so I guess you, you just end up playing six different. Roll an additional tens percentage along with the usual percent. Which, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Which one's the tens? I forgot. <laughs> Is that the... That would be the first die. That would be the... the 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 first digit, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you can justify it through. Oh, I see where you are now. Oh yeah, I'm on page eleven. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm trying to find an example. Example: You are trying to open the heavy stone door of a crypt. The keeper decides this is a very difficult task. Uh, for a strength roll, specifying that a hard success is required. You roll the dice, but the result uh, shows that you have failed as you rolled above half of your investigator's strength. You ask if you can push the roll, stating that you're... Oh, and it ended. Where? Oh! I see. I, I was reading the page uh, wrong, that your character is using a spade to lever the door. The keeper permits a second roll, but warns you that if you fail this roll, not only will the door still be closed, but something may hear you and could be coming for your blood. Okay. Well, that didn't tell me how the roll works. <laughs> yeah, the tens dice is the 10, 20, 30, and then the units is 1, 2, 3. The tens dice is the what? The 10, 20, 30, 40 through 100. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. Right. Gotcha. Just because gotcha. their other reference to unit dice is like, oh, okay, so that's. Mm, right, right, that makes sense. <laughs> so you would take, if you had a penalty die, you would. It's like advantage in D and D, where like you take the lower of the two. Uh, something like that. Then a bonus die would be you take the higher of the two. Yeah, it looks like it used the tens dice that yields the better or worse result, or better okay. just lower. Oh, that's because, yeah. Oh, right, because <laughs> you want to roll low here. It's going to be confusing. Low so that you're underneath the 
Okay, that's going to be a really confusing thing that I'll never remember. Yeah, I like it. Like, I think it makes a lot of sense because uh, it means that your skills, instead of every, like, numbered skill having a corresponding modifier, it's just, like, if you have... Oh, yeah, because it, it, it makes the... Uh, probability very clear that like if you have a skill of 25 that's a 25 percent chance of success mm -hmm. um but <coughs> yeah it's 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 counterintuitive mathematically it does make sense but yeah i agree it's <laughs> all right generally i'm kind of against using like uh, my my philosophy in D and D is often about like not caring about probability or like um i guess not obsessing over probability like i i i, uh, I kind of believe that randomness in in a, in a game is only as good as the illusion of randomness so like like the illusion of randomness is very useful i don't really care if there's any actual randomness there but the, oftentimes the best way to create the illusion of chance uh is to just actually use it but if i could make every you know if, if a game could make every decision uh behind the scenes and just make me think that it was chance mm -hmm. that would probably be better if it could make all those choices without me getting suspicious but sure uh, that's that's not really reasonable <laughs> Part. But uh, but because because the but I still I still do really like that it makes the probability very clear to everyone because the probability is sort of behind a mask in D like the D twenty every every side of the D twenty is a five percent chance right um but we we don't really think about that so like a plus one is a is plus five percent. Yes, yes, that does make sense. The thing the thing that could get that could get bad about this kind of like percentile game. I don't know if this game, maybe this game avoids it, but I mean, the human mind doesn't really work on probability. It doesn't really, we don't really think about probability the way that it uh, works. Plus 1% doesn't matter Yeah. To me, to me, even though it, I guess, kind of matters, it doesn't really. I mean, a failure and a success or just two binary states that we, you know, true it doesn't really. Yeah, I mean, how many? One percent doesn't mean anything. How many arbitrary? How many times <laughs> have you heard somebody attack on an arbitrary number of nines onto the end of a ninety-nine percent, just to make it yeah, seem right. more likely? <laughs> Fifteen nines. Yeah. That means it's basically a hundred percent, but not quite. Yeah. <laughs> It, it feels very special when you roll a natural 20, but like, you know, it, it's just as likely to happen as any of the other sides. Mm -hmm. Over time, it becomes less likely to be the same, but each time you roll, it's the same. And, you know, all this stuff is very obvious, but I guess in the moment of playing D&D, it just doesn't feel that way because that's not how the brain works. Right. We want to recognize patterns and all that stuff. Well, so generally, I am all about forgetting probability and ignoring it and just thinking about it in terms of the like religious way that we think about the world. Like, I encourage magical thinking for d, &D because it's fun, yep. even though I know it's all bullshit. <laughs> uh, but I, I do appreciate that this thing makes the, the at the same time, you know, contradictorily, I, I do appreciate that this makes the probability very digestible. 
<laughs> I guess it just all depends on the implementation. All right. Hopefully, hopefully all the increases and decreases are large enough to be noticeable. Yeah. But as they say, 67.3% of all statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah born in dunkirk raised in Chicago, or now lives in chicago cool yeah i say aside from what else he's carrying and what he actually looks like I'm, it's pretty much done awesome you assign skills and stuff according to the like the profession and all that yeah yeah it's really cool is this digital, or are you writing this down it's, on the actual it's all, sheet? It's all written down. So, yeah, he's a professor of anthropology and archaeology and such. Classic Indiana Jones type. Except, yeah. Except he's tall. <laughs> he's over right. six feet. All right. He has glasses, and I thought I'd give him one more weird injury, which is a double-jointed left thumb. I have no idea how that would play into Luck, sanity. So you roll sanity against your sanity score, or roll percent. Oh yeah, which 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 page is this on? Uh, on uh, sanity. It says on the paper, page eleven. Oh. But we, based on a couple page numbers you called out, I think we might be looking at a different. Oh, it starts at the bottom of. That's weird. It starts at the bottom of page 12, is what I'm saying. Hmm. <coughs> oh, but it doesn't actually say that much here. <coughs> Whenever you encounter the horrors of the mythos or come across something mundane yet horrific, such as stumbling across uh, your best friend's mutilated corpse, you make a percentile roll against your current sanity score. If you roll over your current sanity score, you lose a greater amount of sanity points. Uh, all right, so you could succeed and still lose some sanity, depending on what you saw. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, you know, um, the... Uh, um, uh, Adventures in Middle Earth basically has a sanity like hmm. mechanic that works almost exactly the same as this, except they call it uh, the shadow. Ah, okay. It's, it's just like corruption, exposure to you know um, <laughs> evil things. Right, right. I got it. <laughs> it's a little more moralistic. Uh, if you roll under, you lose less or not. The sanity is the sanity loss is generally described for an event. Wait, the sanity loss is generally described for an event as something like zero slash one d six. You know, zero for success, one d six for failure, or two slash one d ten. The number before the slash. Your sanity loss if the roll is a success. Huh. <coughs> an investigator loses five. Oh, if an investigator loses five or more sanity points as the consequence of a single sanity roll, they uh, have suffered a major emotional trauma. The player must roll D100 if the result is equal. Oh, man. I if the result of this roll 
is equal to or less than their intelligence <laughs> going all across the character sheet. Yep. Uh, the investigator fully understands uh, what has been seen and goes temporarily insane. Oh, that's another thing about like the philosophy of this game that I find compelling, but also um, just isn't really how I think about the world, is that like really understanding something in this game is bad. Like ignorance is the right. only thing keeping you alive. The fact that you're clinging to things that are untrue. If you really understand things, you're dead. Mm -hmm. That's uh, kind of nuts. I don't know how to take I, that. I mean, I don't agree with it. Like, I, I, I just don't think that way about the world. That, that's not. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do find it compelling. I do find it like interesting. In a, in, in a, I don't know. I guess with things like Lord of the Rings, it's usually more about like mortals aren't meant to understand this or something. Like somebody's supposed to understand it, but not you. Got it. Yes. <coughs> if he um, is in te if he is temporarily insane, the keeper gets to add a phobia or mania to your sheet, such as fear of the dark, confined spaces, kleptomania. While temporarily insane. You may be presented with a hallucination. Ah. <laughs> Some of the sanity stuff, I do, I do, I do wonder how you make this not feel goofy. Because a lot of the time, it is, it is so. It's just, it's such a swing that like someone sees a body and goes into a fit of temporary insanity in which they like steal a bunch of shit. Like it just right. it it. A lot of them are like, you know, they don't go from one to, you don't go from like one, uh, from uh, zero to 60, you go from like zero to blue. Really, it, it, it's just, it's like a, a weird leap <laughs> that, that seems very, very silly. Very, uh, yeah, well, might just, <laughs> but maybe not. <laughs> yeah, maybe in the moment it, it doesn't. <laughs> if you, are. I mean, I, I guess. <laughs> It's also, it's up to me to choose, I guess, if I'm running the game, right. to choose what happens. So maybe it's up to me to make it not goofy. <laughs> well, it looks or like... Or make it goofy, and that's okay. Yeah, well, this whole temporary insanity, <coughs> and then the the keeper presents the investigator with hallucinations. Mm -hmm. That is a ghoul creeping up on you, a homeless man asking for spare change. And then the investigator says, hey, is the, I can, I'd like to make a reality check just to see if this is real or not. Right. Make another s sanity roll <laughs> and see if you go even more insane. I, I almost want to present the reality check rather than as a chance, just like if the, because it seems like if the player would genuinely like to not, because it seems like a lot of the time a reality check is there so that the player can basically, if they don't like, this uh, state of mind for their character, like they don't, they think that that hallucination doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. It feels like that's oftentimes what the reality check is there for. And in that case, I almost just want to make it a choice, not a, not a chance. You know, right? Just say like they can choose to lose some sanity and shake off the illusion. I don't know how that would work in practice, though. But it just seems to me like if if it's there to avoid any like dissonance between what the character what the player you know to, to make it more fun to make it uh, so that the i don't know make it feel give the player some control over what the character thinks right uh then i and then i then i kind of just want to make it a choice where they can choose to sacrifice sanity for uh awareness but hmm. <laughs> or character but i don't know if it would work And combat, <laughs> where they can begin with, it is best to try to get away. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, that's a, that is kind of a that's something I liked about Dungeon World, is that a lot of times the player would choose 
you know, if you roll a mixed success on your ranged attack, you get to choose whether you lose, you know, you spend a lot of ammo, right. or you have to move into an unfavorable position, or miss. Well, you got to meet Phoenix, right? I did, uh, for a bit, yeah, we had a couple special. <laughs> My gosh, he would just, he, he had a goal, personal goal, just to never actually make an actual attack. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean, like he would... Like oh, always do a spell or something? No, he would talk his way out of everything. <laughs> oh, right, right, never right. Never make an attack roll for anything. And he would bring That's... it up every single time. He's like, Sean, if you will remember, I have not actually attacked at all in this campaign. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds annoying, but possibly fun also. It was hilarious, the entire thing. It was just like, oh my <laughs> gosh. And then he'd just sit there and write poetry. While he wasn't, while his turn uh, yeah. wasn't up, <laughs> <laughs> and then use that poem as his heal spell or whatever. Like, dang, that's some good bard role playing right there. Oh, I think I actually have to go. I'm like, my cough starting to spike. Ah, dang, that's all right. Um, we we can we can we can uh, get on another time and, and talk more about this. Oh sure, absolutely. I'm all for it. All right. I mean, I I might be able to do it later today if I'm not tired. But uh, if not, you know, then, then uh, another day. Yeah, I'll I'll keep my chat open. In the event right. we can make something happen. All right. Yeah. All right. See you for now. Yeah. Take care. This was good. Mm -hmm.